Um, good morning, good afternoon, good day, everybody. Um, my name is Chris Davis, um, and it's my pleasure to introduce this, the second in a series of webinars on the IT for IT initiative at the Open Group. Um, our speaker today is uh, a, a close colleague and friend, Jim Johnson from HPE. Jim's a client enablement architect in the software group at Hewlett Packard Enterprise. And his background is in IT strategic planning, enterprise architecture and software development. He holds an MBA in quantitative business analysis and lives in Austin, Texas. Um, I'm speaking to you from Florida on the east coast of the USA. You'll detect from the accent that I'm not a Florida native. Um, I currently serve the university system here um, in the College of Business and it's my secondary role to serve as the chairman of the IT for IT forum in the open group. So my role today basically is to act as the chairperson for the Q&A session at the end. So without further ado, it's my pleasure to hand over to our subject matter expert for today, Jim Johnson. Thank you, Chris. And welcome, everyone. Um, the, uh, as Chris said, the focus of today's talk is around the strategy to portfolio value stream. Um, I uh, hope that most of you were able to attend the uh, earlier webinar that gave a, a background on uh, IT for IT um, architecture in general, but uh, we'll do uh, some catch up on that in the event that you weren't there, that you should get oriented on where we are and the, and the uh, focus of our conversation. Um, so the IT, this is a model of uh, the IT value chain that that, uh, was, that we've developed. Um, it's characterized by uh, value streams across the top flow. These are really the, the direct functions of the, of the value chain, uh, and they're supported by uh, various supporting functions or indirect functions across the bottom. Uh, we think of these these main value streams within the chain as characterized by uh, plan, build, deliver, and run. Um, this is a, a bit of an evolution from the plan, build, run model that we in IT have been um, using for years to characterize what we do. Uh, we think the um, the small change adding deliver is um, a very important aspect because it kind of symbolizes. Uh, a fundamental change in the way we organize uh, to deliver uh, IT services to our customers. And uh, that'll be apparent, I think, as we go through it. Um, the, the center of that, that value stream is really the reference architecture, which is characterized um, by a service model that underlies it and ties it together. And it's a service model is really um, the different, uh, it's a life cycle of a service as it moves through those value streams, those value chains. Uh, it's, it's initially a, um, a conceptual model so that um, it, it's kind of, I like to think of it as kind of the marketing plan for a service. It's, um, it, it's trying to understand uh, why, you're, why you're offering the service. Uh, who your customers are, uh, what's the value of this service to them, uh, where and when do you want to offer it to them. So it's it's really highly conceptual in nature. It's, we, it's uh, really the beginnings of understanding uh, how much it might cost to, to operate a service and, and uh, what the benefits will be. So it really is their cost and a benefit um, reason to be undertaking the service or offering it in the first place. Um, as it moves along its life cycle, it becomes more, uh, you can be characterized more as logical models. So these are, if you think of uh, typical models you might, you might do in software development or in uh, project management uh, of a development engagement, uh, there are views of the service in terms of uh, actually creating the capabilities uh, that it's needed to operate. And then as it, uh, as it may be released and actually deployed into a production environment and begin operating or uh, it may be uh, staged in a service catalog uh, for, for uh, someone to subscribe to, then it becomes uh, a, a true physical service that's in the, in the, um, in the operating environment and it becomes available for, um, for customers to subscribe to it. 
So it's uh, it's the different uh, viewpoints from different um, uh, from different personnel, all under the same animal. It's all it's all a service model, but it's a, a very different set of, of views of that model. So um, uh, the tools and models change uh, as it evolves through, the, through its life cycle. And this is the what we call the level one diagram of the reference architecture. Um, it's the it, the value uh, streams are represented along the bottom, so it kind of flows from strategy to portfolio, through requirements deploy, to request to fulfill and detect to correct. Um, it looks like a a very linear model, but it, you know it's it's really a, a continuous flow and uh, and uh, there's uh, feedback all the way uh, from beginning to end and that's one of the major features of it is this uh, interconnectedness through throughout the value streams um, you kind of read this thing by the the blue boxes are are the functional components that um, act on the artifacts and the artifacts are these these black boxes, so they're lifecycle data objects, um, and they are tied together through uh, the solid lines that represent relationships between the data objects. And um, the purple uh, circles along the bottom are a special designation of data object, and that that's the service model backbone. So that those those conceptual, logical, and uh, realized uh, stages that we talked about are are uh, characterized by, by physical artifacts that are stored uh, in a service model uh, along the way. And if you um, strip off the functional components, uh, you get a, a really nice view of the relationships uh, between all of these key artifacts and um, how you can trace um, from, from beginning to end or end to beginning uh, these relationships uh, by by referring back to the service model backbone that runs along the way, and if you if you think about you know how difficult it is today in today's operating world to if you've got a a physical CI in operations uh, to be able to understand uh, if there's say an issue with it or an incident, um, even knowing what service might be impacted by that incident, or uh, even and more difficult to understand what customers uh, may be impacted. There's um, just a tremendous amount of work that we do in IT uh, today to uh, to understand those relationships and uh, make them um, available to us in operations. Um, one of the one of the really great aspects of uh, the reference architecture is it um, it defines out what are the what are the essential um, artifacts and the relationships that we have uh, in IT uh, that we have to deploy, we have to be able to uh, understand, we have to capture, and we have to um, uh, instantiate the relationships between them uh, that makes all that really possible. And you can, and then you can begin to think of uh, all, the, all the systems of insight that you might be able to create if, if, when you can follow these relationships of your of your key controlling artifacts that, uh, throughout the IT life cycle. So, um, looking at the at the value chain again, uh, in order of the value streams, uh, just very briefly, uh, strategy to portfolio um, is all focused on planning. So it's about you know, defining the objectives uh, for a service and aligning them to the to the business strategy and, and various IT roadmaps. Uh, it's about optimizing the portfolio of services that, that IT uh, offers for the business. It's about getting your demand documented and uh, consolidated and prioritized, and then um, uh, creating and managing uh, the set of requirements that, that can uh, realize those demands. And analyzing all that and then and, you know, choosing what's the right set of investments that IT should be making in any given period to uh, respond to that demand. Um, the requirements to deploy is all about focused on on building uh, or sourcing and turning the investment decisions into services. And 
Um, we'll have we'll have follow-on webinars that go into detail about requirements to deploy, and request to fulfill is uh, is focused on the, the delivering and making those services available to a consumer, and and that's really all about um, you know focusing IT's relationships to its customers through a catalog, through a catalog view that people can order uh, known services with expected uh, deliverables, and then. Detect to Correct is focused on keeping those services running in production, and that's the classic uh, operational services that uh, are familiar to most of us in IT today. And uh, like I said, you know, these are all uh, this this chain, this this chain of combined uh, value streams is all made possible by that by that reference architecture uh, that ties them all together together. So strategy to portfolio, um, it can be thought of as, as really uh, kind of four major uh, phases or um, aggregations of activities. Um, uh, the first one being aligning to strategy. So this is where, um, uh, we, you know, we, we really focus on aligning what we, what we do, what we operate, what we invest in in IT. With the uh, with the business objectives, um, uh, it's all about aligning to uh, business goals and IT roadmaps so that the investments um, are are optimized and that they come out when the when the business needs them. The platforms are there um, at the same time, and you're not duplicating investments um, where where it's not necessary. Um, so, so IT strategies are created and documented, and and the means that they are to be achieved are spelled out here in this in the strategy uh, component. So, the realize the portfolio is really most about understanding the portfolio um, and, and how it relates to the connect collection of financial assets. So, our our individual portfolio stocks and bonds and Bank accounts is kind of the analogy we typically use, and, and so rationalize our portfolio of services is, is a similar kind of aspect. We want to um, we, we want to make sure that our risk is managed and that uh, we're offering uh, we're investing in a portfolio that actually achieves uh, our, our IT objectives that support the business objectives, much the same way we want to invest in a portfolio of stocks and bonds that achieves our life. Uh, objectives. So, so by modeling the relationships between services and the business architecture uh, it is really a, a key aspect of being able to make those investments decisions. Um, as, as we'll talk about later, uh, the focus of IT, uh, you know, we're being we're being driven to really focus on uh, supplying supplying business needs uh, paramount. Uh, rather than just running IT uh, because it's the way we've always run it. So prioritizing the backlog uh, is, is another major aspect. You know, demand comes from a lot of different sources. So we've got uh, from the business uh, change requests and enhancements, um, from from the business and IT strategic planning, we've got various investment initiatives and major policy decisions. And uh, from our production environment, our run uh, side of things, we've got problems and uh, patches and, you know, security issues that have to be addressed. And then um, IT itself always, always has, you know, a set of uh, technology modernization and transformation uh, activities that it has to undertake uh, just because uh, the tools of the trade are constantly moving underneath us. They're constantly changing, um, and, and I, IT organizations have to keep up with it. And then managing investments um, is is uh, is focused on really deciding which of all these demands we really want to address at any given point in time. Um, the the number of demands in the backlog, uh, you know, you, there's no way you can do them all, and so you have to have some way to uh, discriminate between them. Uh, so there's there's a lot of constraining factors on it. And obviously, there's budget, 
there's uh, the, the amount of risk that um, the organization is ready to take on, and and that risk, you know, that risk risk threshold changes with organizations depending on where they are in the calendar or where they might be in their business cycle. Um, uh, the the backlog has to be evaluated with respect to. Uh, what new value would be lost by not doing something? So it's not just um, you know, a decision of w whether it's worth it. It's it's uh, there, what's the opportunity cost for not doing things that have to be considered. And then uh, resources are are a constant constraint. So the availability of really scarce resources like technology expertise um, and and domain specialists. So, so given all that, IT has to make a choice, and uh, those investments that that rise to the top uh, then become proposals that can be um, uh, acted on by the requirements to deploy a uh, uh, value stream. It it helps to think about what happens in uh, in, in these activities uh, by looking at uh, comparing it to kind of our changing economic model. Um, uh, an analogy that is often used is that IT is is rooted in the past in in operating in a kind of a planned economy where uh, we we ran things based on a big central plan and we decided uh, you know how much capacity we're going to allocate for a given uh, application or service and when and where it's going to be offered and we go execute that plan and um, if if our business uh, moves in a different direction and uh, there's more customers in a given place than than we had planned, then you know we have the the uh, the economic um, uh, we have something similar to bread lines where you know the uh, a commodity that is is wanted uh, we don't have enough of it, or, or we may have um, something similar to a, a lot of cars being built and sitting on a lot uh, that nobody buys because. There's not enough gasoline. It, it's um, the the effectiveness of the plan is everything. Um, well, the the ability or you know IT operating in that manner is quickly going away. Um, uh, we we've got to move to more kind of the analogy of a market economy, um, where we're delivering what the market wants when the market wants it. And so the way we did things in the past and and say and in aligning strategy where we'd have a big two year plan where we'd have you know maybe quarterly reviews but we would build a, a cost model from top to bottom and say here's our plan and we go forward and uh very only occasionally make changes to it. Um what what we're gonna be doing in the future and what we think the IT for IT enables is the ability to really collapse that that planning cycle uh, into much shorter aspects. So maybe quarterly rolling planning cycles with uh, with a even a biweekly CEO review. I mean, um, it has to be really quickly adaptive, and the decisions are made based on um, uh, on the impact of the business instead of um, instead of impact to the cost. Right. So we want to really. Uh, get the business stakeholders involved and react quickly, so that uh, uh, as I as I said, our our model is is more like a marketing plan where we understand what customers want and we adapt to it really quickly. In rationalize the portfolio today, mostly um, the decisions are made uh, based on uh, you know what do we have to do to support uh, our core business. And then, um, what kind of resources do we have to get things done? And, and in the future, we we really need to cater to the to the business needs, and we're going to have to be organized uh, in much more agile teams with uh, you know services provided through multiple sources instead of just everything we can build, and very flexible skills. And, and prioritization uh, today, so much is is done uh, based on you know what we have to do. Often, if you when you go through your your budget and your plan, you, you essentially 70 or 80 percent of your of your budget are are uh, devoted to just keeping the lights on of what you're currently doing. And what you just what you have left over is something you might try to make do some innovations with. Um, 
uh, our focus is really on business process efficiency. Um, and, uh, and operationally, you know, it's very much a, uh, a focus on stability, almost a, a view that, you know, change is evil. And so uh, no changes in the next quarter or at least until after Christmas or, or all the kinds of policies that you're used to seeing. Uh, where we want to get is really have um, innovation be the, the trump everything and it be the cent center of our prioritization uh, where we, uh, we we're really flexible and we accept uh, sourcing and outside service where it makes sense and IT being really the broker uh, of those services um, as much as they want to be a developer or an operator. And um, the focus you know, really moves to managing the risk and security of these services um, rather than uh, the day-to-day -day aspects of it. And um, again, customer impact, loyalty, revenue, those things that, um, that impact the customer should be one of the, one of the driving prioritization factors. And then managing the investment, um, uh, you know, Today, we really ha have very little ability to actually look and see if the, if the investments we made um, are actually uh, realizing the benefits that we wanted. Um, our data collection for, uh, for, for this is really, uh, it's kind of a spreadsheet-driven world in a lot of cases where you roll up information from department to department and put it together. Um, and going forward, we really want to be driven by by those top-down goals, so you know, at, look at our investment portfolio and what what benefits did we want to realize? Um, how are we doing? Are we on track? Uh, are the are the goals the same as they were when we launched this service? Uh, and and we can only do that really by by having a, a good set of KPIs tied in at a service and and feedback uh, coming in on that service on a on kind of a real-time basis and. Um, it goes beyond feedback or the, the KPIs that we think of today in the operational world. Like, you know, yes, we really want to know um, that we're meeting our, our service level agreements or that our performance objectives are being met on a service. But um, we also want to know, you know, is the, is the customer benefit there? Um, is our customers adopting it at the rate we thought? Um, are they paying? For it, what we thought they would pay for, um, are they um, are they substituting some other service uh, instead of using our service? So it's it's really a, a market based view um, of how our investments are are operating to help us decide uh, what we what we invest in in the future. So again, here's that reference architecture view, and um, as we said. Strategy to portfolio is really it's really the first column. It's it's the smallest um, uh, value stream um, in terms of how many functional components and data artifact, data artifact it manages. And so as we look into it and a little bit closer in in um, the enterprise architecture component, um, this is where uh, we really create the service architecture and relate it to the other dimensions of the enterprise, like I said, the, the business architecture, uh, the technology and information architecture, and, and those roadmaps and plans. Um, the service architecture is the essential data object. It, it includes um, uh, blueprints for the service, uh, enterprise guiding principles that apply, and uh, technology roadmaps that, um, that would impact this, this service. The uh, service portfolio component manages um, the entire portfolio of services that are in, in plan or uh, in production or in transition or maybe have even been retired. So it's, it's the authoritative source of the services that, that, IT, uh, that IT even knows about. So either they deliver it or they broker it or they may have in the past or it's uh, it's in a it's going to be offered in the future. Um, it's the complete picture uh, from a service standpoint, and um, it's so it's key data objects are the conceptual service 
and the conceptual service blueprint. And we talked about, um, you know, w what that conceptual service means and, and the information that's contained in it. So the portfolio demand component um, is where uh, we log and maintain and evaluate all that demand. Um, it's it's really the single funnel where we get a view to all that demand. So uh, sources can include like project uh, ideation, service requests, management, incident management, continuous improvement. Um, uh, you know the sources from from all over the organization, and the idea is to funnel them into this one one function where we can have them all together in a single view. Um, the portfolio backlog item is the key data object that it manages, and um, and, and as as you would expect, that represents um, what that demand entails, who's asking for it, when they want it, why they want it, um, uh, etc. So the policy component uh, manages the creation and the review and the approval and audit uh, of IT policies. Uh, so that policy data artifact is a um, thinking of it as a central repository for repository for storing and and organizing all types of IT policies. So um, uh, things like policy distribution and acceptance, um, exception processing, revision history, uh, regulatory and security compliance rules, uh, review periods, all those kinds uh, of activities um, happen within the policy uh, functional component. And um, then the proposal uh, functional component is really, again, it's the authoritative source for the list of IT proposals, um, and these proposals may or may not result in, um, you know, scope agreements that lead to um, IT initiatives that actually get acted on. And the scope agreement is, is um, uh, it really spells out the objective of this proposal. Um, so uh, things like the, what are the cost of it, what's the benefit, uh, what are the key uh, uh, attributes of a proposal, when do we need it, um, who who is going to deliver it or who might deliver it. Um, it's all about the you know the goals for for a, a eventual IT IT service project. This is a level two architecture, so this is a, a little bit of a deeper dive into those uh, five functional components and their and their data uh, artifacts. And it includes uh, the relationship of those artifacts to its surrounding uh, world. So the kind of grayed out boxes are either functional components from uh, an adjoining value stream, like uh, requirement to deploy or um, even uh, detect to correct, uh, or they're uh, supporting functional components. So there's cost modeling, uh, IT asset management, and at this level, you see uh, some more details about the data relationships and, indeed, the information flow from other functional components. So you can see uh, cardinality between, between these, these key relationships, um, and, and, and you get a sense then of, you know, how, how, one, func how one conceptual service uh, may lead to multiple um, uh, conceptual service blueprints, um, how, you know, policies relate to conceptual services and requirements. And um, it's, this, it's this relationship, this core relationship that uh, I've talked about before is, is so important in being able to see end to end across the chain. So, um, you know, what are, the, what are the benefits to IT and to the business of, of, try, of structuring uh, strategy to portfolio in, in the way we, we uh, operate IT? Um, we've tried to summarize them here, um, and we've talked about them before. So, uh, but to some extent, this holistic, you know, view of demand across across um, uh, the PMO, um, your your cloud and your enterprise architecture and your service portfolio, um, uh, being able to align to business priorities. So, 
enhancing the business agility and speed that that you can deliver innovation to the business is really uh, one of the big drivers. Um, uh, data consistency and and just visibility of the data uh, to just think how many places you have demand captured somewhere today in some form or how many places uh, you, you may have uh, proposals or ideas uh, policies uh, policies are are you know the the mechanisms that we use to store policies or to evaluate policies are um, are very widespread today with uh, very few standards. Um, financial visibility, uh, like we said, we want to be able to to get real time feedback on um, on how our services are um, are performing uh, versus how they are expected to perform, and what is their real world impact to the business. So, how are they contributing to uh, business objectives and the achievement of business goals? Um, traceability is uh, is is core to this whole thing. So those core those key data artifacts being traced across uh, their life cycle, and then uh, communication uh, between IT between uh, sources of operations in IT between operational groups uh, between IT and its business partners. Uh, it can kind of take on a different um, a different measure when you've got all these other things, when you've got traceability, when you've got uh, financial visibility, when you've got consistent data that you share, when you've got holistic views, um, your communication with um, all these stakeholders becomes uh, much more efficient, much more effective, and um, and, and uh, very much more um, satisfying, I think, to everyone. That's probably the word I was looking for. So we've identified some a set of uh, critical success factors and and key performance indicators for strategy to portfolio um, in the area in service portfolio rationalization. You know, to really succeed at that, we we've lined out uh, some some KPIs that. Um, need to be tracked and followed um, specifically around the you know the you've got a formal service portfolio function uh, and you've got a and you've got a process um, that you've got taxonomies for understanding the the functional and technical redundancy and business value of the of a service that your processes uh, you have processes for consistently evaluating and and tagging portfolio entries um, that you do ongoing rationalization um, and that your service and IT portfolio management are, are themselves rationalized. Um, service portfolio financial analysis, you know, accounting records are produced and, and uh, on a regular basis and the investment spent in each of these is monitored. Um, these are these are just you know detailed um, things you can look and measure to see uh, where you are uh, from a maturity standpoint on each of these these critical factors. Um, service portfolio reporting and analysis. Um, the, you know, the service portfolio needs to exist, and is there a basis for deciding which services are offered? Um, service investment tracking. The investments in each service is quantified in the service portfolio, and um, and it's reported on a on a prescribed cadence. The improve to improve customer satisfaction. You know, are customers satisfied? Are you measuring? These are these are very simple things that um, we want to focus on and and just begin to uh, up our maturity in, in all of these levels. Um, critical success factors for stewardship of IT. Uh, some of the things that you see often are CapEx versus OpEx, um, software license percentage in use. Um, some things that you don't see very much are planned versus actual cost. Um, um, actually rolling up all the cost to a service is probably something that um, 
is not done on a regular basis and certainly not across the entire portfolio of services. Um, and understanding, you know, what is a cost to a customer is almost impossible to measure today for a lot of what we do. Um, security, uh, obviously, a uh, very important factor. So, you know, what's the frequency of security assessments? Um, and what are the noted deficiencies in security standards? Uh, some very simple KPIs, uh, but um, have a look at them and, and uh, judge yourself and uh, just see where you stand on this, and it can help you decide where to really get started on, uh, on uh, thinking about uh, structuring your, your planning activities um, in alignment with the IT for IT architecture. And there's a lot more information um, at uh, the Open Group. With, uh, we've got a standard published out there, and you can go, uh, you can go download a, a document that goes into more detail about all these functions and strategy to portfolio. And uh, I encourage you to do so. And uh, Chris, I think I'll open up for questions at this time. Fantastic. Thank you, Jim. Um, and thank you all for the questions that have come in. Um, what I propose to do is to um, allow Jim a moment or two to get his breath back and just re-articulate exactly what you've just seen and then to go back towards the beginning of the deck and take the questions in a kind of a chronological order based on Jim's presentation. So Jim has introduced you to the first and arguably the thinnest of the four value streams that we use to conceptualize the IT for IT initiative. Um, also be aware, please, that the value stream orientation is a very, very high level view. And what Jim has attempted to do in a very splendid presentation is to zoom you from the sort of helicopter view that we would use to pitch to and demonstrate value to a CIO or another member of the C-suite in an organization. The value chain and value streams are business orientations that they rapidly lock on to. And he has driven it down through the five levels of abstraction that we use. The reference architecture that you've seen him illustrate in the slides is roughly level three. By pushing down through the functional component level, through the data artifacts, we get into the data integrity required to maintain the CMDB, to provide consistency in the data models in products and services that vendors like HPE, ServiceNow, CA, BMC, and so on, all need to offer to bring this reference architecture into operation. So not so much a health warning, but just some perspective so that you understand that Jim has spoken merely of one of the four value streams that we use in IT for IT. So if I may, what I would like to do is to go back to the beginning. So in slide two, Salman asked, is there any similarity in the plan, build, run, monitor model of COBIT to what we've done in IT for IT? Absolutely, Salman. The idea is that the reference architecture that we've articulated in this new open group standard, through that process of abstraction, can accommodate any process model through the reference architecture. So the purple line running through the slide that you see now um, is a little bit deceptive, A, because of its narrowness, and B, because of its richness. This will work in an environment where we are reliant on more traditional structured methods, or in an organization that uses DevOps and more agile techniques. So we don't have an explicit process model in there. So this thing is very flexible. And what we've done with Porter's value chain is essentially flipped it on a horizontal axis to provide that sort of margin. So the values that are added our efficiency in the business of IT, as you've heard Jim explain, and agility. 
Okay, the second question, could you give us a little bit more on managing demand, Jim? Specifically, what steps could be taken to consolidate and prioritize in that um, prioritized backlog box third from the left? Can I take that one back to you? Yeah, so I, the, I think the key message is, um, is enabling a, a single view to the entire backlog. Um, uh, today, you know, demand is, like we said, that you've got um, service requests, you've got um, project uh, proposals, you've got IT initiatives, you've got architecture changes, and um, they only come together once every, you know, planning cycle to a large degree, and they're looked at um, they're considered in isolation until that time. So the idea is to have a view to all of those all the time in almost real time and to be able to um, associate those with the services that they impact or um, that, that depend on them and um, be able to trace from that service then back to um, the business drivers that you're trying to satisfy for the business in order to allow you to, on an ongoing basis, understand, um, you know, what, what goals are, are, are the customers asking you about and what do they align to and is there, say, is there momentum building in any specific service versus another so that yeah. you can continually uh, turn that dial on on where you're making your investments and where you're focusing. Yeah. Thanks, Jim. So, Dave, I hope that answers your question. Another question was raised by Iyad Hindi, who asked whether or not enterprise architecture should be involved in the strategy to portfolio phases earlier. And I'll respond to that by reminding you all that this is a reference architecture. So what we provide is prescriptive, but not entirely fixed. So the huge benefit which Jim has begun to articulate is the flexibility and transparency of the insights that this provides. So we have folks from Westbury Software working with us to provide the monitoring of KPIs, continuous improvement and so on. So that's ongoing work for us. But remember that the emphasis here is on a reference architecture, something that has not existed before. This enables us to enable IT to be run like a business. Some research that was provided for us by Gartner estimates that in a $1 billion IT operation, the cost improvement, a cost reduction of between 5 and 20% should be feasible through this. And the reason is because of the dynamism of this space. So virtualization, service orientation, which is becoming more and more endemic in the IT service management space, both from a technology provider point of view and also the expectations of internal customers, make this a very key place that we need to be ourselves agile. And this is what the reference architecture enables. Yeah, if I could just to expand on that a little bit, a lot and and um, a lot of these visuals uh, imply a process. And when we see an arrow pointing, you know, left to right, uh, we are trained to see a, a process and a um, like a, a a flow of things. And the point to remember is we are not talking about processes here. And so if you were to take your strategy to portfolio organization and build a process model, you would, you know, you would probably see um, uh, stakeholders from enterprise architecture involved you know, front left in your process, in your process model, but it's not the way it's depicted here. Absolutely. Um, and so, although it's prescriptive, it's prescriptive guidance, it doesn't actually regiment roles, responsibilities and positions in the organization. So I hope that's clarify that. Several questions have arisen on the mapping to ITIL. 
Um, we see this initiative as highly complementary to ITIL. This is the first time that there has been an, if you will, off the shelf, ready to use set of prescriptive guidelines that can be brought into the business of IT. Um, we don't see this as replacing ITIL. This is highly, highly complementary. This is driven by enterprise architects working in this space and is a TOGAF driven initiative within the open group. So we have used TOGAF to drive the whole of our endeavor in building the IT for IT reference architecture. Um, I wouldn't argue that we map to TOGAF. TOGAF is just a framework. This is a reference architecture for the business of IT. Um, but it is very complementary to ITIL. Um, we wrote, I wrote an appendix for the pocket guide for the IT, IT for IT initiative, which compares and contrasts ITIL and IT for IT. So there are a number of similarities, but there are also some significant differences. So this is much more prescriptive and of use to both customer and vendor organizations. So I hope that's responded to most of the questions there. Um, there are a few more that are just coming in on the screen, but I'm going to ask you to step forward briefly, Jim, if I may, to the slide where you've got the strategy to portfolio level two, the one where you get down into the functional components forward a little bit more, mate. That's the one. Again, this is now a more detailed view that demonstrates, if you will, the uh, richness of the deeper levels of what in the old days we would call functional decomposition. So now we're pushing down through level three of five in our IT for IT uh, collateral towards the levels where the CMDB would exist and product and service specific specifications need to be made in order to maintain the integrity of the data. This is all about the data. So be aware that this detailed view complements very much the very high level, more helicopter view that we give with the value chain and the value streams. One of the questions that's just popped in um, which I didn't have time to note and type a response to is, what are the use cases of the IT for IT reference architecture? At the moment, the best response to that is Mary Jarrett's wonderful presentation from the Edinburgh meeting a few weeks ago, when she highlights how IT for IT has been uh, introduced worldwide across shells, very complex operations in exploration, oil extraction, retail operations, financial services, and so on and so forth. We also have use cases from organizations like Delta Lloyd, Accenture, and various others, which we share through the open group meetings. So those will be coming soon, and we hope to build those more directly into the standard itself so as to um, articulate the opportunities to apply the reference architecture. Hugo asks, IT for IT is nicely evolving into the reference architecture of an ERP for IT that embodies the best practices for modern IT. Is there a com companion open source community attempting to create an instance of an ERP based on IT for IT? We're not aware of it. But this is the open group. So the purpose of sharing all this in this webinar is to encourage and maintain the integrity of contributions from subject matter experts like yourselves. Um, but that primarily comes through involvement with the open group. So at the moment, we have some 60 companies in the forum. We have seven major software vendors. I have altogether about 250 enterprise architects, all of whom are senior subject matter experts like our speaker, Jim Johnson. And we estimate that to date, some 20 to 25 man years of effort has gone into the material that you've seen briefly outlined specifically in relation to this one value stream this morning. 
And at the moment, we are at the point of having the new standard downloaded around about 2,000 times. So there's obviously a great deal of interest in this because there is now the potential to um, spread the community and the ability to contribute to this initiative. So I hope that responds to the question about how to get in, into the conversation. And Frederick asks, are the contributors of this initiative working on a maturity model that would help IT departments to adopt this approach regarding the assets that they're managing? So virtualized assets like cloud and big data. The answer to that, Frederick, is absolutely yes. Um, my colleague, uh, Mike Fulton and Eric Vitter lead our adoption work group. And one of their um, efforts is to look at the maturity of both users, professional users, um, of the IT for IT collateral, the materials, so people certification and the continuing professional development of people. But we will also be looking at CMMI and trying to create some equivalents of that so as to certify organizations. And obviously, we'll be certifying the products that conform to the IT for IT standard. OK, I've got a question here that I'm not entirely sure, sure I can respond to. Alan Baldo asks, could we please elaborate a bit on how the automation aspects that could be applied to this subject? I think I'll let you speak to that, Jim, a little bit in the context of what we call systems of insight. Yeah, that's one of the most uh, exciting aspects of this is being, is if you think about um, automation as we use today, say, in, in operations management, where we uh, have made a lot of progress in, in um, uh, automating the process of, of understanding incidents, uh, categorizing them, and, you know, even um, uh, detecting incidents before, before the the customer does and uh, and adjusting to them um, you can begin to see where with the end to end data and relationships that are exposed through the reference architecture um, you could envision an implementation where you have that kind of um, automatic monitoring in almost uh, any of the processes that that uh, move your your artifacts through through the value chain or through their life cycle, and so where automation could be most important, um, you could certainly envision uh, in the future that that happening, and that's uh, that's one of the fundamental um, capabilities that I think the, the adoption of this the standard set of artifacts and relationships exposes. Excellent. Thank you for that, Jim. And, and the, 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 without whizzing back to it, the third or fourth slide in the deck that uh, Jim spoke to, where we talk about the conceptual service model, the logical service model, and the realized service model, the service model backbone, which uh, sits at the heart of our reference architecture, one of the um, primary contributions there are these systems of insight and the notion to continuously monitor and maintain visibility of costs um, is, is one of the major benefits. So I will close now as, as, as chair and thank Jim Johnson once again for a very, very enlightening uh, presentation and thank you all for attending and your illuminating questions. Um, Simon and I will summarize those and make them our responses and the deck that Jim has presented to you available. Um, and without further ado, I'll hand back to Simon. Thank you, Chris, and thank you, Jim.